Welcome back to the story of liberty. We're talking about the principles of economic liberty. The money cap has been let off the geyser, so to speak. The American economy has strayed from the Constitution in its medium of exchange, the money supply. We can't have an honest money system that we once had with a precious metal standard. We could avoid unnecessary inflation by eliminating the printing of new money the Federal Reserve does all the time. I have one solution, an idea to stop the printing of money is to make the Federal Reserve use a HP photo uh, smart printer like mine that constantly needs new ink every month. When they run out of ink, they can't print the uh, greenbacks. But seriously, our founders knew the importance of having a honest money system of money that we would encourage investment and a good economy would occur in savings. You may remember that history reveals that America could have actually lost a battle for its independence during the Revolutionary War because the money supply was not sound. And it sunk so low that it was not even worth one penny because of inflation. This paper money, called back then a continental, had become worthless. You may have heard of the expression, not worth a continental. They knew there must be some inflation-proof currency, so the United States government was not empowered to print money. It could coin money out of gold and silver, or print bills which were redeemable in gold or silver, but it could not print worthless paper money. So Congress established before the Constitution was adopted that our money supply would be backed by silver and gold. And all other coins, both foreign and domestic, would be valued in terms of the USA silver dollar. You know, when the Union fought the Civil War, it required funds to be uh, borrowed, but the banks demanded huge uh, interest rates, up to 36 so Congress decided to print greenbacks, or fiat money, not backed by silver or gold. These greenbacks were only worth about 35 cents. Eventually, the gold standard return and was used to back our money uh, until 1933, when America abandoned the gold standard again. But the American people, they were required to turn in all their gold, except their jewelry, and receive Federal Reserve notes. That's what happened, and from this time forward, America's currency eroded with coins that were made with much less silver in them, dross in the coinage. And Congress again put the dollar in high gear as the legal tender with no backstop in sight. America was left with fiat currency, that's paper money with no precious metal backing, as the medium of exchange. Today, because of several court decisions, the U.S. government is able to do that through the Federal Reserve. And we suffer the rigors of inflation on and off. We hear a lot about fiat money. The Greenwood Press defines it as money not backed by gold or silver and created by the will of the government. Now, what is the problem with the government simply printing money to pay its bills? Well, the problem is that these new dollars do not represent any real goods or services that add value to society. When a furniture company makes a piece of furniture or a plumber fixes a broken pipe, this adds value to the economy, to someone. But just putting paper money into banks does not constitute any real value to the economy. The probability of inflation goes up because the more money in the economy causes higher prices for the same amount of goods and services. Think of it in terms of a Monopoly game with children playing Monopoly and then Grandma comes over and doubles the amount of money in the game. All of a sudden, Boardwalk is no longer $400 but $800.
everything doubles because of the money supply. You know, to the surprise of many, our federal government really does not make money, it does not print it. The federal government has handed this duty over to the Federal Reserve, privately owned, and it's given the sole power to print money by a fractional reserve banking system controlled by the international bankers. Our nation's debt is probably the main reason the Federal Reserve prints money, and in a sense, our national debt equals the printed money supply. America then uses this freshly crisp printed paper. Boy, I think it probably smells good too, coming off that press. And so it can make payments on the funds it borrowed from others. And of course, it spends trillions on several government-sponsored and welfare programs that it pays for. Now, frankly, if it did not print the paper money, it cannot pay for the many, some of wasteful, bogus programs, unnecessary programs that it creates. It prints the money so it could pay for these programs. You know, the scary reality today is that several finance-type people in power, they see a viable solution to America's economic problems by decreasing the standard of living for all Americans, increase the interest rates, and actually slow down the economy further while increasing the money supply. They are aware that this causes bankruptcies and foreclosures, but as crazy as this sounds to some, think who benefits when average Joe's repair shop declares bankruptcy, an eventual for foreclosure. The lender benefits, of course. Unfortunately, when this happens over and over to individuals and their homes and businesses, the lender ends up with possession of the wealth created by the private business sector. Someone clearly said the lenders, the banks, own the politicians. The government borrows from the bankers. The borrower is a slave of the lender. An essay by Lewis Eve, The Money Myth Exploded, he describes the real cause of inflation. It involves the story of five shipwreck survivors and an Eastern European, whose name I will call Fred, who was washed up on a deserted island. The five survivors include a carpenter, a miner, a farmer, an animal breeder, and an orchard keeper. The Eastern European is the banker who floats onto the island with a printing press and a cask full of rocks, which he tells all his hosts are gold. Little do they know it's fool's gold. Fred, the banker, a belated arrival to the island, proclaims, Well, you could thank Providence because I'm a banker and in no time at all I'll set up a system of money guaranteed to satisfy you. Then you'll have everything that people in civilization have. The five stand in awe of Fred, the banker. They see him as an all-wise and omnipotent man. They swoon over his gold, as they have been conditioned to do. Little do they know it's fool's gold. Fred sets out with his press, printing money, backed by gold, of course, which he lends at $200 per man at 8% interest. Well, he gives the paper money out, and after the sun rises and sets 365 times for the year, the time for collecting the interest arrives. Now, the loans with interest come due, and Fred, the banker, demands his total of $1,080. But among the five survivors, there is only 1000 and that amount has been redistributed, so they realize they have been duped. So they go to meet with Fred the banker, and Fred already guessed what was on their minds, but put his best foot forward, and while he listened, the impetuous farmer stated the case for the group. He said, how can I pay you, how can we pay you $1,080 when there is only $1,000 on the entire island? That's the interest, said Fred the banker. My friends, hasn't your rate of production increased? 
Well, sure it has, but the money hasn't. And it's money that you're asking for, not our products. You are the only one that can make money. You've made only 1000 yet you're asking for 1080 That's an impossibility. Ah, but listen, fellows, bankers are for the greater good of the community. They always adapt themselves to the condition of the times. I'm going to only require the interest, only $80. You can go on holding the capital. Ah, bless you, Fred the Banker. You're going to cancel the $200 each of us owes you? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, but a banker never cancels a debt. You still owe the money, all the money you borrowed. But you'll pay me each year only the interest. If you meet the interest payments faithfully each year, I won't push you for the capital. Set up a system of money contributions, let's call them taxes. Those who do have more money will be taxed more. The poor will pay less, of course. We want to be fair. See to it that you bring me in one lump sum the total of the amount of interest, and I'll be satisfied. And on top of it, your little island nation will thrive. So the boys left somewhat pacified, but still dubious about Fred the banker. Production increased, barter decreased, and yearly interest payments were made. Eventually, money became scarce. Well, that's called deflation. And again, the group went to Fred the banker. Oh, now boys, be reasonable, said Fred. Your affairs are booming and it's thanks to me, your banker. A good banking system is a country's best asset. Don't ever forget that, boys. But if it's to work beneficially, you must have faith in the banker. You must come to me as you would do a father. And if it's more money that you want, very well. My barrel of gold is good for many thousands of dollars more. See, I'm going to mortgage your latest acquisitions and lend you another thousand dollars right now. Aha, the national debt goes to 2000 Now only Fred holds the real wealth in mortgages. Taxes, interest, increase, and then finally calamity hits. Foreclosure follows and those dispossessed now have to rent their lands from Fred. Things are brewing and Fred follows the lead of the Rothschilds by using his press to print more paper money. Like the Rothschilds, Fred knew that whoever controlled the nation's money supply controlled the nation. But now the day of reckoning came, and all but Fred had been dispossessed and impoverished. Then, providentially, a pamphlet washed up on shore, and the miner, the most neutral politically, read the pamphlet and got the liberals and the conservatives together on this one issue. They eventually unmasked Fred and his gold. Fred had no gold. All he had was worthless paper money, worthless as a continental.